Uh, quicker sex uh, can be better. Uh, try to avoid sucking. Uh, more people, more risk. Embrace dirty thoughts and clean sur surfaces. And of course, uh, wear a mask uh, during having sex. Uh, these are just some of the advices the San Francisco Department for, of Public Health uh, has issued a few days ago, just ahead of this Valentine's Day in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, and only the, only, already this short example shows uh, in which way uh, the COVID uh, crisis has affected uh, not only the political economy, but the so-called libidinal economy, uh, namely uh, sex, love, desire, affects, emotions, anxieties, fear, it has affected uh, the deepest, innermost, intimate sphere of humans. Uh, and uh, what, we have, what we will be trying to explore tonight uh, with our guests at this special edition of The Internationalist uh, is not just uh, the future of love uh, and desire, the future of libidinal economy. Uh, no, we will also try to explore uh, how did Valentine's Day become what it is today? Uh, we will speak about uh, emotional capitalism. We will speak about uh, the commodification of Romans. Uh, we will speak about the various ways, which you can see precisely in these times, in our times, in which big tech, whether it's Silicon Valley or China, uh, is deeply transforming the way we relate to others. As we can see now, we are having this a very special date for me and I hope for you as well uh, uh, over the screens uh, and many people today are actually dating over the screens, dating over Zooms, uh, saying that this feels like a job interview and not a date. Uh, so you can see that also here many things are changing. Uh, but besides posing these questions, uh, we will hopefully also explore uh, what is the emancipatory potential of love uh, how can social bonds, uh, uh, social relations, uh, like mutual aid, for instance, uh, be reinvented? Uh, why they must be reinvented? In which way can we together reinvent it? And last but not least, uh, one of the questions we will explore today uh, is uh, how can love become the foundation, and it already is, the special ingredient of new internationalism? Uh, welcome uh, to a special edition uh, of The Internationalist for Valentine's Day. And we are back. Uh, it is uh, my great pleasure that uh, for this Valentine's Day during the pandemic, uh, I have a very special group of people uh, uh, with me. Uh, so let me present all of them and invite them on the screen. Uh, first is uh, Eva Iluz, uh, a sociologist uh, and uh, a scholar who has written very important books which have influenced myself, but I guess everyone here in the room or in the rooms uh, about emotional capitalism, so-called cold intimacies, uh, and who is well dealing with these sorts of questions. Uh, she will speak first, and after that, uh, each speaker will have a short opportunity uh, for a starting statement on some of these questions. Uh, while in the second round, uh, we will uh, discuss further. Uh, hi also to Ejet Temelkuran, uh, my, my dear friend, writer, a uh, fellow member of the Council of the Progressive International, uh, who just published, congratulations, uh, a new book uh, called uh, Together, uh, 10 decisions uh, for 10 choices for a better now, right? Uh, here is also Michael Hart, who is, uh, everyone is joining us from different corners, except Slava, me and Alenka, who are in the Balkans, but there is a small border between Slovenia and Croatia. Michael is joining us uh, from Seattle. It's good morning, Michael. Uh, I guess many of uh, uh, of you who are watching us either live or later now 
uh, are familiar with uh, Michael's work uh, for decades. Uh, he has been co-writing very important political books uh, together with Antonio Negri, From Empire to Multitude and so on. Uh, but he himself uh, has also been writing uh, about uh, red love, about Alexandra Kolontai, about love as a political concept. And these are some of the topics uh, we will discuss with Michael today. Uh, then here is um, Alan Kazupancic, also my dear friend uh, from Slovenia, uh, author of the book What is Sex, uh, many other books which are mainly de dealing with psychoanalysis and many other topics most recently. Uh, I guess it's not published in English yet, but I'm much looking forward to it. It's a book about the end. Um, and last but not least, not at the end, uh, uh, my comrade Slavoj Žižek, uh, also joining us from Ljubljana, author of plenty of books, uh, who has uh, been writing and speaking on love and revolution as well uh, for decades. Uh, I think Yanis Varoufakis has to join at some point. Uh, if not, uh, uh, well, what can we do? We already have a great people, a great group of people here for a special date on Valentine's Day. Uh, let me shut up now and leave the floor to, to Eva. Uh, and then we will, have, every speaker, we have an opportunity to speak. Eva, so please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you can approach the topic from any perspective you find interesting. Thanks for being with us. Yes. Now, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. And uh, Sketcho, thank you so much for putting together this beautiful panel. And I'm always delighted to do anything with you. So um, I'm going to give a short statement. And since uh, this is the day of love, I wanted to start with a poem uh, written in the 7th century uh, BCE by the lesbian poet Sappho. And I start with this poem because I think that in that single poem, Sappho lays out the key elements that we have come to identify as quintessential to the emotion of love. So here's the poem. Some celebrate the beauty of knights or infantry or billowing flotillas at battle on the sea. Warfare has its glory, but I place far above these military splendors, the one thing that you love. For proof of this contention, examine history. We all remember Helen, who left her family, her child and royal husband, to take a stranger's hand. Her beauty had no equal but bowed to love's command. As love then is the power that none can disobey, so too my thoughts must follow my darling far away. The sparkle of her laughter would give me greater joy than all the bronze clad hero. That's the pun. So in my view, far more than Diotima, the priestess um, in Plato, who will expose what love is, it is Sefo who articulates um, the idea that has come to remain with us of Eros, the god of love. And the idea behind Eros, the god of love, is that, you know, as you know, his arrows wound a person fatally and make them lose reason and sense. For Sappho and for generations that would follow her, love stands both opposed to and above the realm of masculine pursuit of glory and battles. And even Parmenides made of Eros the first of all gods, so keenly felt its power by the Greeks. And Sappho turns it here into a force higher than, than male prowess and valor. And she places, as she says, the one thing that one loves above military splendors. And so this is a clear affirmation that love is superior to matters of the state, to military feats, as uh, Slavoj Zizek would say, that it's revolutionary, it's above interest, and it's above self-preservation. And it's also above here, we may note, uh, motherly duties, 
since it compels and justifies that a woman, Helen, would leave her child. So in Sappho's poem, I think love um, um, acts or is presented as a force, an exogamic force that compels individuals to leave their group, that disembeds people from their clan, from their nation, from their family, in short, from society itself. This is, in a nutshell, the mythology of love that we are still living with and which, in a way, we are celebrating in a day like Valentine's Day. So let me think about what Valentine's Day, I mean, about the day itself um, uh, we, and the love it is supposed to celebrate. So Valentine's Day today is celebrated in at least eight countries that I know of. Uh, the United States, Canada, Mexico, the UK, France, Australia, Denmark, Israel, Italy. Uh, it's, at, it's actually nine. And it's, um, it's a holiday in which people purchase gifts for friends, families, and even pets. And um, in 2019, uh, more than $21 billion dollars was spent only on Valentine's Days. And, you know, if you look at the curve, actually these numbers have been steadily growing throughout uh, the years. And another also interesting fact is that 60% uh, of people between the ages of 25 and 35 uh, will celebrate uh, or celebrate Valentine's Day. And this number drops dramatically uh, the older you get, which suggests also that there is a kind of um, a change, a historical change in the importance that people attach to this day. And in some article, I found that each American was expected to spend $162 on average on Valentine's Day on products such as candy, greeting cards, flowers, an evening out, jewelry, clothing, and gift cards. Companies also on Valentine's Day are fighting heavily with advertisements to encourage people to buy their products. And so Dunkin' Donuts, for example, has created a campaign where their consumers can compete on Instagram to have the most Duncan love uh, by using their um, um, their uh, heart-shaped donuts on uh, sale, and they also um, do that uh, on live streaming from certain locations to report on the contest, and where the goal obviously is to create an interactive atmosphere uh, so that consumers can also purchase those Dunkin' Donuts. So all of this is simply to uh, put in, to, to introduce in a nutshell, my uh, thesis that I have developed in a few uh, books. Um, one, it, and it is that capitalism, especially after World War II, has steadily produced emotional commodities, which I call immodities. The emotional commodity, I think, has gone under the radar of theories of consumption, but is a very strong uh, threads accounting for the development of capitalism from the mid 20th century uh, onward. So the claim, the view about emodities, it's not to say that emotions motivate consumption, that's banal, and anybody who knows marketing knows that, but more crucially that emotions have become a kind of commodity. It's a, a bit similar to the notion of commodity experience, such as tourism and entertainment shows. These are intangible commodities that turn the consumer uh, into an object upon which they act. And so, in fact, a crucial dynamic of the expansion of capitalism has been to extend the commodity experience and what where what we buy is no longer a commodity outside of us, but 
On the contrary, it is ourselves that we consume. We consume ourselves having a certain emotional experience and thus we become the co-producers of the product we consume. So emotion and commodities, if you want, are co-produced and undo the act of consumption with emotional performativity. The emotion comes along with the uh, consumption. And um, one category of commodities that have played a very important role in signaling, creating, reinforcing, maintaining um, in uh, our relationships to others, our caring relationships to others, most conspicuously in friendship, romance, and the families are, you know, caring commodities, commodities which have um, uh, emerged in the context of the withdrawal of the family into the private sphere, itself a result of capitalism, and the redefinition of the family as an emotional unit, and the increasing emphasis on emotions and intimacy for the formation of the self and identity at large. So in this context, in the context where personal life, intimate life has become an ideal, emotions were made into commodities through the spectacular growth of gift giving practices, which as anthropologists have taught us are crucial to the maintenance of interpersonal bonds. And modern Western uh, gift giving practices have been institutionalized simultaneously as consumer and emotional practices. So for example, such holidays as Mother's Day or Valentine's Day are at the same time consumer and loving rituals. Valentine's Day became popular in, the, in America as a consumer holiday as long ago as the 1850s, while Mother's Day arose around the 1920s roughly. And these two days were from the outset simultaneously consumer and emotional practices oriented towards gift giving. And uh, the purpose was to affirm was one's membership both to the market and to what I would call a caring unit. They do not create emotions, although they may, so much as demand the ritual renewal of, of the affirmation of the emotion. And so this for me illustrates the ways in which consumer culture has not only organized um, uh, uh, um, relationships, but also intensified a moral economy of emotional expressivity. And such intertwining of caring and consumption is designed not only to express care, but to establish specific emotions as well. I love you. And I say it again on Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day is a kind of, I think, um, elementary form to think about such process of intensification of personal relationships and commodification happening at one and the same time, which highlights a key fact about capitalism, namely that capitalism does not only create alienation and fragmentation, but actually works through the very texture of social relationships and actually intensifies such personal relationships. And I think romantic love has been key uh, to this process of perfect and smooth integration of consumption into subjectivity. So having said that, how much can love still serve as a um, mythology of individuals affirming their desire against society, as Sappho's poem suggested, is indeed a question we can all ask ourselves tonight. Thanks a lot, uh, Eva, for kicking off uh, uh, our special date for Valentine's Day and reminding us of emodities and how emotions are becoming commodities, and also for giving this background on Valentine's with on Valentine's Day with these very interesting numbers, which I didn't know uh, how much is actually spent on this holiday. Uh, I think uh, you posed a brilliant question for our next speaker, Michael Hart, uh, who has been dealing uh, with these sorts of questions. You know, how can love still have a subversive, subversive character? How can love serve 
the revolutionary struggle, how, what is the relation between politics and love, especially in times when, uh, lo when love emotions or emotities are being monopolized and mani manipulated. Uh, so I leave the floor to Michael uh, since we have other speakers as well. And uh, well, please, Michael, let's go. Thanks. And um, I do think that, especially on Valentine's Day, one has to uh, operate a critique of love to make a space for a political concept of love, um, like Ava was doing, uh, definitely in terms of the commodification. But I think on Valentine's Day, one also ought to attack um, the notion of the possessive couple of the antisocial couple, the couple that imagines itself whole and therefore not in need of society. That's what I mean by the antisocial couple here, which which is being promoted, which I, like I say, precludes uh, a the possibility of a political or even revolutionary concept of love. But I don't really wanna talk about that, or at least not in this first bit. I thought it'd be more useful to, well, partly explain why I became interested in love as a political concept it's, and, and what its basic characteristics are. I mean, so I, I mean, I first became interested in, thinking about this because I thought it corresponded to my experience and the experience of many militants in political activism. You know, the militancy feels like, has shares characteristics with, or, or even is best named by, uh, by, by love. Um, and what I mean by it primarily is this, or here's the just very simplest way of thinking about it, is that love here has two characteristics that, at least the first two that we're th thinking through, the first is the nature of the bonds that, that it's, that's made, and the second is its transformative character, uh, its transformative experience. And for me, at least, this is one thing that makes love a, a more adequate concept for me than, in this context, friendship or, or solidarity. Um, so I wanted to explain these two, at least how I'm seeing or give an introduction to it in terms of um, in terms of Baruch Spinoza, which I know might sound like a, a certainly uh, whatever um, erudite withdrawal from it, but I think it's very practical. For me, it's very practical. You know, these two elements I was talking about in terms of bond and transformative character. So the first about bond, Spinoza defines love as always these beautiful geometric de uh, definitions. Uh, love is joy plus recognition of an external cause. And also to understand that, you have to see that joy is defined as the increase of my power to think and to act. So therefore, love is the increase of my power, both to think and to act, with the recognition of an external cause. Um, for me, this is super practical. I mean, for instance, think about it in terms of thought, you know, in, an intellectual notion here. Um, most of my encounters with other people are not joyful, you know, would be sad in the sense that they don't help, they don't make me more powerful to think. You know, like when I, it, usually I think I understand something, I start talking with some other people, I feel stupid. I don't understand it anymore. But there are some people, and one has these experiences where you're together and you think together and you actually become more powerful. You become more powerful to think. I mean, I would say, hold on to those people, like hold them tight. And that's, and that's at least the first notion of what love is, that you are made more powerful recognizing your bond with them as an external cause that makes you more powerful. So I would say the same thing if you, if you can recognize it in, in the question of thought, you know, like what I would say, like groups you study with that make you more powerful, intellectual groups that make you more powerful, a specific people that do, you know, that um, I think of it exactly the same way in terms of militancy. You know, there's certain people with whom you are more powerful to act. You, you can act and act and think more. So anyway, that's the first one about bond. And this is what I would, at least trying to situate love in a political context, thinking of the bond that way. The second Spinoza element that helps for me, like I say, uh, leading to this notion of the transformative character, for him, it starts with this notion of the power to be affected. And he says that Spinoza claims that the power to be affected corresponds to the power to act. So one normally thinks about the power to be affected as a weakness you know, as a vulnerability, or there's a lack of sovereignty, you know, that you, the, the extent to which you're affected by others is, is a matter of your weakness. And Spinoza wa wants to insist, no, in fact, that's a strength. The strength, how would one say it? It'd be something like a way of gauging your capacity to live in the world, to be affected by others. And that being affected isn't a passive thing. It corresponds to, like, you, you cannot be powerful in your actions, in your thought, 
without equally being open to right? and vulnerability might be the word I'm not exactly sure to others so your your power to act is is completely related to your power to be affected and this is what I'm thinking of is is understanding the transformative capacities of love the strength or the power that's associated with your ability to register and to uh, be transformed by the world. Again, this is where I was, I was thinking this transformative character is different than, at least as I generally understand friendship. I mean, there are a lot of different ways of thinking friendship or, or solidarity or certain alliance, you know, that this transformative that you become, you become other, you become different in love. And that's and think of that in a political sense, in a in a in a sense of militancy that you become transformed by. You became you become something else. This is the power to be affected. I mean, you might also understand it in terms of the difference, you know, in the re, in the revolutionary tradition or maybe others between the concepts of emancipation and liberation. I mean, emancipation is simply the same being the same. I mean, the subject. There's no subjective transformation in emancipation. One is simply without chains, whereas whereas liberation is really completely different. The the subject is transformed in liberation. You you do not uh, remain the same. You the, in fact that's what's what's involved in it. So let me um, I, I'll end there because I see I'm just over six minutes, so I should stop. Um, I just wanted to pose these two basic ways of thinking about love in a political context or even a revolutionary context as as the quality of the bonds the the, the uh, bonds that are stronger than death or whatever, how one was going to say it. And the other is this transformative character, the, 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 the ability or the power to become different. It seemed to me at least two basic elements for starting to talk about love in a political or revolutionary context. Great. This is great, Michael. Uh, and I think it really opens the floor for, for Edge. I don't know, Edge, what you prepared, but I, I know that your new book together is dealing precisely with uh, the transformative capacities of love, friendship, uh, solidarity, mutual aid. Uh, so I leave you the floor and we will definitely return uh, to the questions opened uh, by Eva and Michael. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. This is like always happening on an online date. <laughs> but that no. makes, makes it more real in a way. Now you'll see that this lineup is a work of genius because actually I'm going to talk about Spinoza or Spinoza's cloak rather. But let me start by saying that this is my first um, Valentine's date and I made a spectacular beginning. I hope this will carry on like this. <laughs> And it's also the first time I speak about love in public uh, because I'm suffering from the same uh, shyness, so to speak, uh, that most of us today feel. Uh, we always feel the urge to hint some sarcasm when talking about these two words, but especially love, unless, of course, you are not afraid of appearing uncool. Not many of us are, are brave enough uh, to use these two words without st stitching to it a retro underpinning, rather. Love and revolution, whenever they are mentioned, uh, they call for, for an extra explanation. We feel like saying, no, we are not that naive to really believe in these words. The smirk we feel obliged to put on uh, when we say or hear these words are actually the sign of a horrible defeat, if you ask me. This is the bitterness of the defeated and the cynicism of the defeatist uh, on the progressive front. And this smirk makes me think. It is because it's rather tragic that today it's the only, you know, it's only the religion, namely Christianity, that uh, can use the word confidently without the need of sarcasm. An equally pitiful fact is that the last time uh, I saw people, um, you know, shouting the word revolution, uh, it was when Capitol Hill was in, insurrected by the Trump supporters. It seems the words during the last four decades have been occupied by its new settlers and finally they're entirely annexed. So that is why when progressives talk politics, they tend to shy away from these two words, especially love. It is unfortunate that the people who dare to imagine a better world uh, rather fear the word love and other emotional and moral questions, for that matter. Uh, morality and love 
uh, seem to be left to the monopoly of religion, unfortunately. With this matter in mind, I have been thinking about Spinoza's book. That's why I'm so happy that Michael mentioned it before me because I don't have to talk about the, the philosophy part of it. But I'm rather thinking about Spinoza's cloak. As you know, uh, after being declared as, as heretic, he, was, he, fell, he fell victim uh, to a lynch attempt. And he survived the lynch attempt, but he had a tear on uh, behind his cloak. They say that he kept this cloak until the end of his days. Uh, and they say that uh, he kept the cloak just to remind himself how lucky he was. But then considering the fact that this guy wrote substantial amount on friendship and love, I think there's a you know, deeper uh, thought under keeping this cloak for the end of his life. Uh, I think, I take it as a promise, uh, Spinoza's cloak, a promise uh, to love the human despite the actual humans, which is a very timely matter, if you ask me, because this is a time where we are constantly subject to the worst representations of our kind, the algorithms and the financial web that surrounds our communication sphere uh, is in love with the spectacular evil and with the outrageous. Therefore, we keep seeing the worst representations of our kind, and this is the hardest time to love the human. And on one side, there is the spectacular evil, and the good is given for self-protection only the kittens. And love is given a broken wooden sword to protect itself. So my question is, can we reclaim love in politics, uh, for progressive politics? Can we take back the word, uh, which is essential for a better world? And my answer is very, very simple. Yes, we can and we should, because I need to be, I need to love more than being loved. And I find this simplicity uh, and jumping from uh, jumping off from the simplicity crucial uh, for today's progressive politics. And thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot, Eje. Uh, uh, I can see already a lot of comments uh, in our on our YouTube channel. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. And lots lots of love uh, to everyone who is who is watching us. Uh, there is a. Funny comment saying, I would like to call Michael Hart as Michael, just as Eja called him. Uh, what a great group of speakers. I guess uh, you can call Michael, Michael, and Eja, Eja, and everyone by the name uh, to make it more intimate. Uh, and there's also a question which kind of brings us to our next two speakers, uh, namely to Alenka Zupancic and Slavoj Žižek. The one is missing, Mladen Dolar, of course, uh, but uh, the representatives of the Slovenian School of Psychoanalysis uh, and the question is by Conor Habib, so maybe Alan or Slavoj, maybe you can integrate it, an answer to this question into your uh, 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 short statement. The question is, if there is time, I'd like to know about how the radical libidinal erotic propositions of Wilhelm Reich, uh, if instead of being easily dismissed, are taken seriously, and what would you say about that? Um, that's just one question. I suggest you integrate it, one of you two, and I will follow the questions uh, and we will come back. Uh, so I leave the floor to Alenka now. Uh, glad that you are here. Inspired to hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Strechko, very much. It's a real pleasure to spend this evening in such a great company, um, even if it's only online. And I guess this will be why in Valentine I will definitely remember, Valentine's Day, that I will remember. Uh, and as a matter of fact, speaking of commodification of love, uh, I heard a funny joke yesterday about, uh, about Valentine's Day, uh, which is also a kind of funny response to the, uh, this theme, this issue of commodification of love. Uh, to understand the joke, you must remember that in some countries, uh, November 1st is celebrated not only as All Saints Day, but also as the so-called Day of the Dead. So we visit um, fun um, like our dead and pay respect at, uh, uh, um, when they're buried. So here is the joke. You don't need to be in love on Valentine's Day, 
no more than you need to be dead on the day of the dead. Uh, I think it's a kind of uh, good uh, ice-breaking introduction to the, this question of, uh, of love and of its commodification, which of course can only take place by means of its valorization. I mean, you can sell things if they are of a certain value. So you have that there is, this goes in pair, the valorization of love and its commodification. So when you advertise love, you engage in, uh, in the logic and creation of a certain profit. You engage it in the logic and creation of profit. Of course, obviously, at the same time, you are also in the position to define what is true love or to suggest some kind of ideal image, uh, the access to which you are then selling with your products that uh, Eva was mentioning. But nevertheless, I claim that love is not like any other effect or thing that gets or that underwent the process of commodification through valorization in in capitalism and that love in the kind of broad sense of the word uh, which implies desire sexuality relationships and so on is kind of a singular in the sense that uh, it constitutes uh, the very intersection of the social and the individual or subjective um, it constitutes what we could call a kind of open line between them, or to use another image, it is how the individual, the subject, is implicated in the social and the social in the subject. It is their eccentric core. And I think this also accounts for what Michael mentioned as this kind of transformative uh, dimension uh, of both. There is a way to transform one via the other, or there is a certain short circuit that can be transformative of both sides, subjective and social. And I think this kind of uh, mutual implication, this kind of eccentric topology of, uh, of love, obviously you could say that all affects uh, are situated at this uh, intersection, but I think love is precisely kind of the emblematic um, effect of this uh, situation of constituting this intersection. And I think this is also why from the very outset, the 20th century revolutionary emancipatory program to kind of create a new social relation uh, also included the program of liberation of love or sexuality. And it is also this uh, mutual implication, I think, is also why uh, this aspiration to liberation was, as a friend of mine, Aaron Schuster, pointed out, why it was marked by a kind of fundamental ambiguity. Namely, is it sexuality or love that needs to be liberated, uh, delivered from moral prejudice, social prohibitions, and so on? Or is it a humanity or society that needs to be liberated from sexuality or love in this sense? Is love the object or obstacle of emancipation? Is love a bourgeois notion or a name of an emancipatory event? And I guess the, the answer is that it is both at the same time, that, that love is a kind of a paradox of the social logic or a logical paradox of the social. It, it, it is kind of its internal topological complication. And this is why it seems sometimes uh, that to get uh, rid of love uh, would be to liberate the social of its complications, distensions, uh, subjectifications, and so on. And that this would open the path uh, to harmony. On the other hand, you have just to mention this reference to Wilhelm Reich, uh, this kind of opposite tendency, which claims that it's enough for us to liberate our sexual desires and drive completely from the social restraints and uh, everything else, the social order as such, would be recomposed in a kind of uh, harmony. So the, these, these are this kind of a two uh, parallax views on this question. Um, 
but I guess if I remain, uh, if I return to what I was saying before, so th there are these ideas that um, to get rid of love or sexuality would liberate the social of its complications. But of course, it is very doubtful if the social would even exist without this complication called love. Um, I really don't think so. Uh, and we could also say that if love is not or no longer so trendy as it used to be a while ago, but appears more and more as source of unnecessary complications that could be avoided, perhaps, that this has in fact a lot to do with how the social infrastructure or the infrastructure of the social is disintegrate, disintegrating rapidly all around us. And this really these two really go in parent, we have a proof of it. So yeah, as subjective and exclusive as it could be, love is also a social effect. It cannot be without these things. Um, and, but obviously it doesn't need to be, and this is interesting, personal necessarily. We could say, it's a bit of a stretch, but I think we could say, for example, that the welfare state was a kind of impersonal love for our neighbor, for our fellow human being, that it was a kind of love delegated to an existing uh, as a social infrastructure precisely of solidarity, of care and so on. Um, but it also seems that these days uh, are kind of over and that we are back more or less at the very person to a very personal dimension of both solidarity, of charity, and so uh, on, uh, also in facing all kinds of crises. And again, obviously, the COVID pandemic uh, was and still is a kind of really rude awakening, not the only one, a reminder that some things can only be dealt with collectively. Uh, but of course, we are not exactly there yet, not even on our way there, perhaps. So I will just leave it at that for a moment. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alenka. Uh, and thanks for uh, going a bit deeper in this discussion uh, into the social component of love, you know, how love is not just an individual feeling. I mean, this is precisely what uh, Alexandra Kolontai, the, the uh, famous inspiration of many people here was fighting for, you know, against this kind of privatization of love, individualism, uh, which is very similar to the neoliberal model of economy, if you put it like that. Uh, we'll return to that in our second round, uh, uh, where we will have a conversation among all of us, uh, and also uh, specifically reflect on some questions, how did COVID-19 change sexuality and love? Uh, but also go a bit deeper into into what uh, Edge opened, uh, or Michael, for instance, you know, uh, why is love so important uh, for the progressive struggle? Uh, before that, uh, I'm uh, uh, leaving the floor to Slavo Zizek. Uh, please, if you remember the question about Wilhelm Reich, maybe you can answer it. Uh, uh, if not, I will come back with that question, and I can see many other questions. So after Slavo, we will slowly also go to the questions of the audience. Uh, Slavoj, please, the floor is yours. Uh, you have to unmute yourself uh, or someone will unmute. The big other will, will unmute you, I guess, very soon. Okay, just wait, Slavoj. You are unmuted now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. I'm sorry if my intervention will work as a kind of a destructive brutal spoiling of the illusions and i do it on purpose as a leftist as a communist uh, first let me say it's a complex thought i cannot develop it fully now that i don't believe in this ultimate unity of collective love collective of solidarity and so on and personal love i think agape and Eros and Terry Eagleton nicely translated agape as political collective love and Eros, individual love, passion are to be disconnected. Disconnected, there is a gap between gap between the two. I will now repeat my old thesis. I think that love 
and I'm talking now about erotic love, is, is a catastrophe, literally. My old joke, imagine yourself living a happy everyday life, you have a good job, you meet with friends, blah, 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 maybe from time to time a one night stand and so on, and then you passionately fall in love. All the balance of your life is ruined, you are obsessed by that. Or, and it's really like uh, uh, Eva quoted Sapcho. This is the moment of rapture. Arrow, which is a totally contingent arrow, hits you, you are lost. I'm not saying this is the ultimate fate of love. It's a long work where you try to build out of this uh, kind of a relationship which can somehow function. But returning to Michael's nice example, this love, collective love, which empowers all of you while it affects all of you, let's imagine, very tasteless example, a group of students, professors, studying, let's say Spinoza's ethics, a very difficult uh, text. You, again, you empower each other, blah, blah, blah. And then there is a student there, men, women, I don't know what you are, and you fall passionately in love. It ruins the community, I claim. It's a total illusion that somehow the two will work together and so on and so on. So my point here is that it doesn't, now comes my madness, it doesn't mean that uh, private passionate love can only be this kind of a destructive uh, 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 moment. But I think more and more, warning, uh, that uh, the only solution is betrayal. I got this idea from, of all kinds of people, the one, the writer who recently died, John Le Carré, who in his A Perfect Spy, one of his best novels, writes that the only ultimate proof of love is betrayal, that you betray the one whom you love. And I wonder if you've seen, now I'm going to the lowest of the lowest popular culture, Homeland, the TV series where Carrie, Claire, played by uh, Claire Danes, at the end, she, what does she do, CIA agent? She betrays her own country, so it appears, go to Moscow and leaves there a very intense erotic relationship. There is love, there is clear. But at the very end of the series, we notice that she still works as a spy for CIA sending encoded messages and so on. So I don't think this is to be read that she just fakes love. No, that's the, the way for her to be fully in love. Love has to be betrayed. If you totally fall in love, you are lost. Second thing, what does this mean today for our time? I'm also a pessimist here. That's how I read Eva whom I appreciate very much, this what she calls commodification of love and so on and so on. I agree with her. This is a very complex phenomenon. I think simply that today with all our permissivity and so on and so on, it's not uh, sexuality that has to be liberated. It's love. Love in this passionate sense that is gradually, uh, that it's gradually disappearing. What does this commodification, objectivization mean? I think, again, it's more complex. Again, trigger warning, one of my vulgar examples. Uh, I noticed when I was young, I watched them in hardcore pornography. Did you notice how the man is truly objectivized? The man is usually some anonymous sailor, sailor with his tattoo marks, and he just does his job. The woman breaks the rule and while being penetrated and so on, is allowed to look into the camera. But this is not authentic subjectivization, of course. This is, in some sense, the ultimate objectivization. Because she, the woman, had to, had to perform a fake subjectivization. That's how commodification works today. And uh, why is love in the sense of this absolute erotic passion, 
it would be interesting to go into this, why is love gradually disappearing today? You have a whole trend, Laura Kipnis, whom I otherwise appreciate in her critique of political correctness, she even wrote a book 10 years ago, I think, even more called Against Love, claiming that first it was, you can make love, have sex just in marriage, and so on further or to procreate and then now the last limit is love and her idea of liberation of sex is drop love we have other tendencies today for example this i always considered it irrational very suspicious ideologically this ad advocacy of uh, uh, polyamory like that no love should not be just binary with one person you should be more open and so on and so on so what is going on here? I think that, uh, now I will be very brutal and not to talk too long, jump to a conclusion. I think that uh, what this recent trend of attacking love, which is for me another aspect of what I find critical in predominant form of political correctness is that uh, short remark to conclude, they are, I think, uh, they are simply acting as if Freud and psychoanalysis don't, don't exist. I, as Alenka already mentioned, uh, most of them act as if love is in itself, or sex, a harmonious positive power, then something bad, oppresses it. It can be patriarchy, social repression, and so on, and so on. But uh, I think if there is a lesson to be learned from Freud, it is precisely that love is in itself twisted, perverted, as Freud demonstrated. We don't just have a repression of desire. We always then get an additional twist where repression of desire turns around into desire for repression. You start to enjoy act of repression itself. Or, for, or uh, for example, uh, uh, the role of fantasy. I uh, recently read a report, I often use this story, I'm sorry, of a, back of a, uh, of a scene when they were shooting a hardcore pornographic movie where something absolutely ridiculous happened. The guy who was doing it, penetrating the woman, stepped back and said, sorry, I'm losing erection. Can somebody pass me my iPhone so that I will look at the porn hub to quickly get excited again? Now, this is madness. She had there the real woman. He needed virtual space fantasy to get excited. I think this is not a pathology. I think this is in the imminent structure of love. And this then opens all other problems. For example, I'm a radically feminist. But because of this reason, I don't think that we can simply uh, accept the hypothesis that which hidden in this yes means yes, the hypothesis that we are subjects who know what we want. Yes, we may know what we want, but we don't know what we desire. And I think that this simplistic formula of each of the sexual partners has to be free to desire what, sorry, to formulate what he wants and so on and so on is not enough. Sadomasochism is a fact of love life, what if I want to be in a certain codified way and so on, of course, oppressed? This mess is immanent to sexuality. I don't think you can, you can, uh, you can make it better and so on, but there always is this ambiguity. I, this does not mean that, uh, uh, that uh, no doesn't always mean no from a woman to men. I'm not into these vulgarities. She really wanted it. No, I think it's even much more feminist point that I wanted to make, that, uh, that 
yes can be a more subtle no enforced and so on and so on it's just that there is a sphere of ambiguity my god we are really divided subjects so i think that the first truly revolutionary act is to fully admit this gap in christian terms between agape and eros eros is a big destructive mess there is no way to liberate it in the sense of you erase oppression and so on and we will be happily enjoying our love life permissivity is happening today the result is exploding frigidity and uh, and uh, impotence and you know when i read this politically correct description of that yeah because you overpass immediately just that i finish the sentence i think that what is emerging as ideal form of sexual act today is sadomasochist contract everything has to be written down with all specificities and so on and so on that's where we are moving into that's Uh, thanks a lot, Slavoj, I'm sorry for cutting you, but that's my job. I cannot just be the loving guy. Sometimes I have to do some censorship. Uh, so uh, we are all back on the screen. Uh, we have plenty of questions. Uh, before we make a conversation and go to some of the questions, let me just give a, a short comment on what, try to uh, comment on what you all said, and also try to channel the discussion towards our contemporary historic moment. Uh, namely, there is a pandemic going on. Uh, there is not just a pandemic. You've probably seen also uh, the latest dystopian news that more than 8 million people die each year because of air pollution. So there is also the utter climate crisis. Uh, and uh, my question would be also, you know, connected to what Slavoj just said. Uh, what if the subject, him or, or herself, doesn't even know what she or he wants or desires? Uh, uh, and in this contemporary context uh, of, of the pandemic, which is already going on for more than one year, uh, what we can witness uh, is, uh, I would say, very interesting, but also very worrying. It is uh, uh, an acceleration of the power of technology, uh, not just in the sense of uh, online dating sites like Tinder, uh, where now it's becoming quite famous to, to put in your profile that you're vaccinated, Uh, which I think is the opposite of what love should be, you know. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that if you're vaccinated that you are in any way uh, saving or being cautious towards the other person, you know. Uh, but so you have this kind of um, interesting phenomenon. Uh, um, what is also interesting, I think, is that we are more and more reaching this level uh, uh, where love is more and more not only turning into emoditis, as Eva would say, but it is becoming pre-programmed in a way. Uh, uh, it is becoming manipulated in a way. I don't know, two examples. One is uh, from Black Mirror, of course, uh, and the show Hang the DJ, uh, where you have an artificial intelligence app uh, which basically chooses uh, uh, your perfect soulmate, you know. So with the thesis that technology is the big other, to put it in Alenka's and Slavic terms, which knows better who is the perfect soulmate for you, And there was recently this other show, which is called Soulmates. I think it's somehow connected to Black Mirror as well, uh, where they imagine a science fiction scenario in a few decades. Uh, there is a company, big tech company, which makes a test. And once, once you take the test, you will know who is the perfect soulmate for you. But what appears there is that in one of the series, you see that uh, uh, one, husband, one, one husband leaves his wife, but in the end realizes that that relationship was much better than the one programmed uh, by technology. Uh, so uh, to come to the question, you know, how do you see, okay, first of all, uh, uh, the power of technology and how is it changing uh, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, the way we relate to others? How is it maybe in a way diminishing uh, the subversive potential of love, you know, because this culture of narcissism, obviously with social networks is becoming uh, stronger and stronger. Uh, how is this situation also affecting risk, for instance. Uh, and the test question for you, do you know how many days were Romeo and Juliet together uh, before they caused uh, this big catastrophe? Uh, well, they were together four days, four days, uh, uh, which tells a lot, you know, two people fall in love uh, and six people die in the end after four days. 
including them, which I think is a, you know, it's an interesting, we could uh, uh, approach it from different sides, but it shows that risk uh, is an elementary uh, 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 aspect of uh, falling in love. Uh, but as you, I think it was Slavoj who said it, that uh, love as a topic is gradually disappearing from the public discourse. And it was already Roland Barthes, of course, uh, who is in his uh, discourse, uh, the lover's discourse, uh, the fragments said precisely this, but then he wrote a book of, about falling in love and not love. Uh, so um, I'll switch to, to, to Eva uh, for the beginning, uh, maybe with a question on this, how do you see that the current pandemic uh, uh, has affected uh, love relationships, but also falling in love, sex? Uh, uh, and then we'll come to some of the questions uh, posed by uh, by our audience. Uh, and it would be great if we make a more conversational round. If someone will speak more than two minutes, uh, we will simply kick out that person out of our date. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Uh, but Eva, please. Um, so, uh, I don't, first of all, I think I don't really know. Um, so, but I can try to offer some educated guesses and anecdotal evidence. I think, first of all, the um, pandemic has created a new hierarchy between um, single people and people in couples, uh, because single people are actually most often dependent on, a, on the leisure sphere, and on a group of friends, even more so perhaps than uh, people in couples. So um, I think it was yesterday or the day before that Le Monde published an article about the great misery of single people, people who are not in couples. And I think you can say that um, the um, confinement has created different types of miseries for different types of people. Um, but I would say a, a kind of hierarchy. Um, th that's one thing between, between single people and people in couples. Then, I mean, anecdotal evidence is quite interesting. I think also it has very much increased the um, desire for a stable relationship, uh, whereas single people are quite happy to live um, on a hedonistic mode, casual sexuality, I think they are more um, um, attracted by um, the, um, the what they imagine to be the appeal of a stable uh, at home uh, partner. And again, a few uh, days ago, I read a piece, I don't remember in which newspaper, I think it was the New York Times, on the increase, incredible increase apparently for semen, women who want to be inseminated to have uh, children. Um, so that uh, seems to me to be a kind of desire for nesting um, and for re returning to traditional uh, forms of family. And then you have totally different uh, phenomenon, opposite almost you uh, have a sharp increase of cyber sex, people having sex through the screen, um, and it has all the characteristics of normal sex, can be casual or it can be repeated. Um, and you have also from within the ranks of established uh, families, um, actually a great deal of misery, um, mothers, uh, find it simply unbearable anymore to be at home uh, constantly with the children and the husband. It was very funny. Uh, there was a program where, um, on, on France Culture, I think, where um, uh, mothers were just, you know, saying, I just want to smother them uh, because they have been uh, for so long with the children. So what it really shows in a way is that this whole notion of intimacy based on the home uh, when you have the um, uh, opportunity to experience it, to experience this kind of very intense intimacy of every moment, is actually quite unlivable and quite unbearable. And that intimacy, what we call intimacy and couplehood, functions only when there is an outside world 
where couples can separate, where they can go their different trajectories, where uh, children can go to school, uh, where each one has his own uh, occupation. So intimacy turns out, I think, to be a bit, I mean, when, when executed to the full letter, um, turns out to be absolutely uh, unbearable for many. Um, and I would say also that um, one thing that characterizes contemporary relationships is that the rules of engagement are very unclear. There is an enormous uncertainty about how to engage in general. I mean, I wrote my last book, The End of Love, is really about uncertainty. And I think now to uncertainty, you have to add a new notion, which is the notion of risk, which you were referring to, Sreczko, um, uh, risk for your health. And, and so I think the sense of being, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned that we are pre-programmed, increasingly pre-programmed by algorithms uh, uh, and manipulated by algorithms, etc. I'm struck by the opposite of how uh, incredibly anomic and uncertain, in fact, the rules of engagement to enter relationship, especially if they are compounded by a management of risk, which we never really used to, uh, uh, at least heterosexuals. I think homosexuals have had to deal with that for quite a long time already uh, with the AIDS crisis. But heterosexuals are, have not been equipped at all to deal with this notion of risk. So, um, so, so these are different, very conflicting, uh, I think, directions. It's going in different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Eva. Uh, I'd, I'd like to turn immediately to Alenka uh, uh, because I think uh, you have also you gave me an inspiration for it, uh, and uh, come back to the very start of this conversation, which is this advice by the San Francisco uh, uh, health, public health department, you know. Uh, uh, don't you think, Alenka, because you've written on sex, uh, 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 a, book on, a beautiful book on sex, don't you think that this is, this kind of advice is, you know, no sucking, uh, quick sex, 15 minutes uh, with a mask and so on, is actually creating an atmosphere of a sort of uh, new puritanism um, a sort of new morality, even if you want, uh, which is actually already, you know, uh, prescribing the risk as well. You know, what is risky behavior, how we should behave and so on. Uh, so that's my question. How did COVID-19 create this? Do you agree that it created a sort of new puritanism and morality, which is very often very cynical? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this is uh, this could be simply attributed to the uh, COVID crisis. I think that we've been witnessing this kind of development toward the, these regulations that all, also Slavoj mentioned, this kind of attempt to kind of preemptively exclude all possible things that uh, could go wrong or, or possible going beyond a certain uh, limit that could be uh, experienced as offensive. This kind of attempt to prevent this and to um, put us on the safe side of, of it were going on uh, before and I think COVID perhaps uh, uh, added another dimension but for me COVID crisis was also interesting because it introduced a new way of thinking about love in the sense also in this kind of positive sense that even if you don't touch someone directly this there, there could be <laughs> Real love. I mean, the, the the fact of not not touching could be an act of love in certain circumstances. So it's. I don't think it is so easily translated. Uh, but I think the question of risk for me it is interesting. Uh, uh, I know also, of course, this uh, comparison risk and falling in love, and then we are now the ideology ideology seems to be out to prevent uh, or safeguard us from this kind of risk. But why, what I found interesting is why, what happened here? Because not until not so long ago, it was this kind of rhetorics of risk was very much part of neoliberal ideology. You know, you cannot profit if you don't risk. You have to risk. I mean, uh, this heroism of risk of just falling and not knowing where you would like was part of a kind of good entrepreneurship. And now it seems that 
also because I really think that these things are here often related the Lib Dem and the um, economy, the social economy. So it, it's interesting because at the same time, I'm also uh, not so sure uh, about, you know, technologies. One thing is this question of cyber love and so on, what the interface does to us. But the, the simply the question of the devices or what apps um, via which we could date these days, just one thought. I think it's interesting because I'm slightly skeptical to this um, app. I think that there are also some different opportunities uh, there. It's not simply that it narrows the scope of our choices so much because it kind of selects the ideal partner for us without our um, participation. because. If we believe in love in the sense that we are using the term here, then love is always always a matter of surprise. It's not that you will fall in love when you want to fall in love, even if all machines calculate whatever, it still can happen uh, or not. And moreover, I think that even the old, old style dating, you know, when we were mostly going out with people from our entourage was a kind of social filter. No, we didn't go on with the out with whatever. It was already like friends work from work, so on. Whereas here, you could actually meet somebody that, that is completely out of your world. I mean, perhaps not using all the filters, but you can actually encounter another which you don't have much in common with. But I think it could happen. So I think it's not. It's a kind of there is an ambiguity uh, linked to this uh, technology, which is. A, could help you with a certain filter, but could also expose you to some kind of encounters that you did not perhaps uh, um, anticipate or something like that. Mm, definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I want to correct myself in the sense that I didn't say this is the only uh, only development. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. yeah I, I see this as accelerating. Even if you look at the data, you can see that the dating sites sure. like Tinder and so on, there is much more activity there, uh, more traffic and so on. But that's one side. But we are definitely in a kind of a position uh, stage of history where it can go in various directions. It doesn't have to always be alienating, uh, for instance, to be on a screen. Eva, I can see your hand. Maybe you want to directly connect. You have to unmute. I, I was wondering if I do, could just uh, react briefly to Slavoj, or it was something that Slavoj uh, said. I'm not sure Please. exactly how he put it, but he said something about the sadomasochistic relationship be, being, it's not his word, it's my word, but a sort of paradigm that has become today the sort of paradigm for a relationship. I could not agree with him more, and I'm going to use an even trashier reference than he did, because Fifty Shades of Grey, which was this incredible uh, world bestseller that sold in extraordinary quantities, is about, in fact, all of it is about staging a sadomasochistic relationship as being this kind of new paradigm, both for love and for sex. And, you know, I try to understand or ask myself what was what was it about that sadomasochistic relationship that was so attractive, apparently, to so many hundreds of millions of people? And I think it is that it really uh, stages, as Slavos said, the contract. It actually, un under conditions of great uncertainty, you create conditions, false conditions, illusory conditions of certainty, because you can exit whenever you want. Um, but also it has this uh, marvelous property of transforming suffering into pleasure I mean, and, and, and of mixing pain and pleasure uh, together. And for me, it's a very interesting way of making sense of also the experience of many women, since the whole novel is about her experience of pain and transforming it um, into pleasure. And it's about managing risk also, because you are actually in the true sadomasochistic relation, sadomasochistic relationship, you are in complete control of the risks. Um, so for me, that has become really that powerful metaphor of, um, of, of, of trying or seeming to go to the limits 
but really actually uh, doing it in a very controlled um, uh, in a very controlled way with very clear rules. It's the only thing where you have very clear rules. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot, Eva. It brings me also to, to, to a question uh, from the audience and then Slavik can uh, later also comment on it. But I think it's a perfect question for Michael. Uh, uh, namely, you know, if on the one hand, this sadomasochistic, sadomasochistic paradigm, and thanks for reminding us on this other trash book, which is a symptom, of course, of our culture. If there is another uh, a symptom, I would say it is the commodification of uh, polyamory. You know, in which way polyamory uh, is coming back, maybe it's related to 68 and this unleashed energy, uh, uh, which brings me back to what Michael said, you know, the difference between emancipation and liberation, you know, uh, what what did really happen here? What is it? Was, is it an emancipation or liberation? Uh, but the question is, uh, and I'm posing it to you, Michael, is uh, what about uh, non-monogamy versus monogamy? Uh, is polyamory just a sign of unbound capitalism, uh, which is, of course, a, a, a rephrase of Alexandra Kollontai? And what would Alexandra Kollontai say? Uh, if she would see this today, you know, in which way polyamory is uh, uh, developing. <laughs> right. You know, I, I would come at that by, it, it struck me that AJ finished by saying, you know, how can we reclaim love? In some ways, I think I was taking something that Slavoj said as a response to that, which was the his um, insistence on the Eros versus Agape question. And, and I would put it something like this. It, and this is now partly getting to this question. I think if we are going to develop a revolutionary conception of love, we have to stop talking about sex and we have to stop talking about the romantic couple. I just don't care. And I think it's a distraction. I mean, um, it's not that they have nothing to do with each other. I think eventually they do, but it completely blocks the discussion. So for instance, this is what I think is so wonderful about that phrase credit to Kolontai, which I don't think that she developed, that sex should be no more difficult than drinking a glass of water. Now, what Kolontai means by this is have sex, have sex with whoever you want, have it as much as you want, as little as you want, as fast as you want, etc. That, that doesn't, but leave that aside, that's not important. What's really important is something different. And until we, until we bracket that and stop, uh, keep referring to discussions, Back to the romantic couple. I mean, I think it's an important discussion. I don't get me wrong. I'm sure sex is an important discussion. Romantic love is an important discussion. But it blocks us from from talking about a social and revolutionary question, which I think is not. So, for instance, then I might be misinterpreting you, Slavoj. But when you were talking about Reich very briefly, I took it in this regard too, that if if Reich believed Wilhelm Reich believed that the or at least the interpreters of Reich believed that the um, liberation of sex corresponds to a, a, a social revolution. That's wrong. I mean, I, I just don't see, I, 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 it doesn't make any uh, sense. I think it's a, worse than wrong. It's a distraction. It blocks our discussion. So I would say, uh, I mean, maybe, Shrek, I'm not uh, appropriately answering the question from the, from the chat, but it seems to me that uh, at least from my purposes, I want to. I want to put it like, and, and I'm trying to say this. This is why the Kolontai quote helps me. At least, it's not a matter of prudishness or morality or puritanism that I don't want to talk about sex. I just find it boring. I mean, I like having sex, and I think you should have all the sex you want. Please do. But that's not that's not a, a relevant part of this discussion, or it stops us from having. Okay, I'm going to stop because I think I'm repeating myself. Um, you're not. You're not. I think it was a sub substantial contribution to our discussion. Uh, be before I uh, before I uh, leave the floor to Slavoj to comment on this, uh, he was mentioned several times uh, by many of you. Uh, I'll leave the floor to Edge, who didn't speak for a while, yeah. and then Slavoj. Uh, well, actually, I didn't speak because you know most of the conversation was about eros, not ag agape, or rather philia. Actually, I would you know. Since we, you know, Michael and I referred to Spinoza, it was obvious that we were talking about agape or philia rather than eros. And, you know, picking up where Michael left, uh, we cannot talk about both, not because there is an unbridgeable gap in between, but because eros, for me, it's a frozen subject. 
and it requires the language of eyes, which is poetry. You cannot speak, like, not cannot, but I wouldn't actually speak with this language about Eros. It requires another kind of language. And there is no gap in between. It is just they are on different layers of reality. Or they are on different layers of our understanding of humanity. So, and why we're talking agape or philia and why we should talk about it, it is because uh, we're talking about progressive politics or politics rather. And today what we need is to reimagine or reinvent love in this political uh, sphere where we are supposed to act urgently. And what we are feeling, I think, uh, we as in like people like me, uh, that there is something myth missing in today's politics. After gulags, uh, after, you know, fall of the Berlin Wall, we walked away from the emotional issues, from the moral issues uh, as progressives. And I think we have to trot back. We have to walk back to those issues and this time more bravely and uh, thinking that we can talk about the good, the love and everything. So, and we will need this because uh, we need a transcending experience. We have to define revolution or politics as a transcending and transformative um, um, phenomena. That's why we need to speak about love because there is something missing that the church, uh, there is something we are missing that church, the religion is monopolizing. So we have to find a way, way to bridge the gap and there is a gap there between that transcending experience and politics because this is the age of cynicism uh, but still, as uh, Alenka said, people do fall in love and they find ways to fall in love. They find ways to surprise themselves despite the algorithms. But still, uh, as vulgar as it may be, people need meaning in their actions. Even the most ordinary, most uh, banal, even the most plain people need meaning. And in order to create that meaning, we are supposed to talk about love, moral, uh, morals and the good. Uh, and that's where I'll finish and yeah, I'll finish with a Cole Porter song, Let's Fall in Love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, next, time, next time we will have an opportunity to have a playlist and maybe play some songs. Uh, an important... Just a small question, uh, because she uh, put it very beautifully, I think. Uh, uh, you put it really beautifully. But don't you think feminism, I mean, nobody has mentioned here feminism that in a way that has been in fact the project of feminist thinking, which is to reconstruct uh, love and makes it into a truly political and revolutionary project. And nobody, none of us has mentioned it. So I don't know, it's a question to you, but. Yeah, I mean, also, thanks Eva a lot. Uh, what we also didn't mention, and I think instead of just relating to high theory, uh, Spinoza, Lacan, and so on, uh, uh, which I also love to do. I think what we didn't mention is uh, how much did social movements uh, teach us uh, about love, solidarity, mutual aid. Uh, for instance, just look at the, the, the struggle the Zapatistas uh, uh, are in for the last decades, in which way they, they transformed deeply the social relations on a daily level. Uh, uh, how, how deep did they go into deconstructing the concept of uh, uh, the nucleus family, which would relate back both to Engels and Alexandra Kolontai. Look at the Kurdish struggle, speaking of feminism. Uh, uh, you know, I think these struggles, and that's why it's so important for us at the Progressive International to discuss these topics, uh, have many lessons uh, for uh, all of us, you know, in our private life, but also in our political lives. Uh, uh, so um, I'm turning uh, to Slavoj, who has been uh, rather unusually patient. Uh, so thanks again for that, Slavoj. And maybe I pose a question for you, Slavoj, but I know Slavoj is Slavoj. You will go towards all the speakers and all the topics, I know. But what interests me and some, some people in the chat is also, how do you see that love can be reinvented uh, uh, in the sense of progressive politics, you know, how can love be used for progressive politics? Is there any use of love in progressive politics? Try, trying to unmute. Yes, I'm on now. Uh, I will try to be as short as possible. I talk too much. But first, let me say that I agree with uh, 
all your nice thoughts about uh, 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 agape, eros, and so on. I just limited myself to eros because today it's Valentine's Day, and Valentine's Day is meant for erotic couples. That's why. So I agree with what you said, uh, but. Uh, you know, when you, Michael, I agree with you when you said, and you, you know, this, uh, that it's not a gap, I correct myself, but it's simply a different, ontologically, a different level of being and so on. But nonetheless, I would like to add something. It's not just sex, let's uh, F as much as we want, sleep around. Something authentic like love can happen also there. Love is not the same as having... So, now I will say something to make enemies, most of you, it's horrible, but you know Lenin's, Michael, do you know Lenin's reply? Probably it's not true, probably it's a fake, to that sentence by Alexandra, this, uh, uh, like drinking water, you know what Lenin said? It sounds may chauvinist, almost, because he said, but nonetheless, I wouldn't like to drink water from a glass from which another guy drank just before me. Uh, why do I mention Lenin? Because here you have an ideal love relationship. My Russian friends are telling me that uh, recently they discovered some further kept secret by Soviet Union. Notice very clear that Lenin had a love relationship with Inessa Armand. You see, it was totally at a different Did you level. Have some problems with the internet or is it just me? It's just you, so shut up. Okay, Do you hear me? Playing. I'm back. Okay, okay. okay. Can I talk? You hear me now? Srebsko. Okay. Hear now me. I don't get it. We just had some technical problems, but we can hear but, you now. Okay, okay. I go quickly, quickly. Uh, first, pandemic and so on, what you mentioned, and sex. You know, uh, Eva, you mentioned some things, and I totally agree with you, this complexity, this that, that direction, but I would say this, my paradoxical experience is that, as Alenka also pointed out, things were going on towards this virtualization of sex already before pandemic, so I think that the lesson of the pandemic, for me, is very paradoxical. If you are just at the level of sexuality, it's easy to go into virtual orgasms, playing, and so on, that love brings body back. For me, the paradox is the love is, can be, in some sense, more bodily than, I, than just sex. I spoke with my younger son's French once, who told me, uh, who has the time today for the complex game of seduction? Isn't it easier? Maximum they are ready to do is one night stand or just masturbate in front of virtual space. So I think pure sex can be transposed into uh, into virtual media. But let me go uh, just to the con concluding point. This uh, uh, complexity of sex, you know, uh, maybe you know the story, Sretsko. It happened after the end of the war of all places in Sarajevo. I report on this in some of my books. It's an incredible story. Uh, a couple discovered that both of them had, under uh, not revealing their identity, uh, 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 erotic fantasies shared with another partner on, uh, on the web, you know, virtual sex. Then they decided to meet and you can guess the solution. It was each other, the same couple. And now comes my Lacanian lesson. The result was not, oh, but we were dreaming about each other, so let's now be a real happy couple. No, the marriage split immediately. That's a nice lesson. Also, what you uh, Emma mentioned about this complexity and so on, uh, or this suffocation of being with a couple, you know, I read a wonderful Wonderful means terrifying for me. Uh, data from or, uh, Japan, Singapore, where sex bots, plastic dolls, are very popular. But you know, when some selling agency inquired into who is buying them, it's not lone men who can help. But you know that over 60% married couples it was, uh, bought them. So my final thought, uh, it's paradoxical. Uh, and 
there are already some indications in this direction uh, in what you said. You, do you know that what I really miss now is, uh, in my experience of pandemic, I miss loneliness. It's so much suffocating these social contacts and so on, or being suffocating with your nearest in the apartment and so on and so on. I am awaiting the end of pandemic to be, and as you ever said nicely, to be authentically alone, you have to be, the other has to be there. Being alone for me is, I don't know, walking and they're disappearing now, it's horrible. To this wonderful in, in uh, around Greenwich Village, in, in the streets where in the evening, cafeterias, bookstores, and so on, there I am alone. I, I expect more loneliness. I like to be alone. And alone and being with others are not the opposites for me. Alone is being with others, but not in a suffocating way. I fully agree with you. I think what we all miss is to have the choice uh, whether we want to be alone or not. Because with this isolation, we are actually more and more connected uh, to other people. That's the problem. Uh, but I enjoy being with you here. Unfortunately, uh, we have to end. Uh, so we will have a last round. Thanks to everyone who watched us. Uh, thanks for supporting the work of the Progressive International. You can also do donate because we will bring in more content uh, like this. Uh, now at the end, uh, I would love all of you for a uh, uh, comment, uh, last words, conclusion. Uh, returning back, ideally, if we can, to the main topic of tonight's uh, edition of The Internationalist, uh, which is love and revolution. Uh, so uh, how can we get out of this pandemic, as Slavoj wishes, to reach loneliness, uh, but also how can we uh, use uh, a different concept of a political concept of love, which might help us to overcome this period. Uh, so I'll start by Michael, and then Michael and each person nominates the next person, so we at least have a kind of simulation uh, of, of some interaction and, and a date. So Michael, you will have to nominate the, the next speaker, and then each like that. What's the question, Shreko? I missed uh, it. I was thinking of the, something. The question is returning to the main topic of today's discussion on love and revolution, and how can we conceptualize or use a different concept, political concept of love, which might help us to overcome this difficult period, which might help us for social movements, political progressive change, and so on. So it's coming back to the question on the relation between love and politics. I'm not, I'm not sure I have um, any good concluding remarks. I think, and maybe you'll say it's the same thing, but my, I feel like the ap opposite and maybe more conventional than Slavoj, I miss the social. I mean, I miss being in common. I miss being in common with people I don't intend to be with. Uh, that's what, and, and in some ways I, I don't see, you know, when you asked Rico about the um, how a political concept of love or political practices of love or something like that can get us out of the crisis. I, it seems to me we have to we have to re 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 reconquer the social before that. Um, it's possible. And if anything, in conclusion, I would just stay with um, a question that AJ asked earlier on, which was how can we reclaim love for a uh, progressive um, struggle or revolutionary struggle, which seems to me the appropriate question which we've only, and, and a necessary question, um, which we've only just barely posed. So yeah, so I'll pass it, since that's our, our game, I'll pass it to AJ for the second one. Thanks, I knew it somehow that you would pass it to AJ. I don't know why, but the- <laughs> Your brother <laughs> in joy of agape, that's why. <laughs> um, I mean, I want people to practice this and because it's not easy. Uh, I've been thinking about this for two years, that's why I wrote the book. Uh, try to speak love without a sarcastic smirk. Try to take love seriously. Hum I'm talking about human love here. Um, try to talk about this in a political context and see how people react to it. Um, and also, I have to tell that I, I mentioned Spinoza's torn cloak because I have been, you know, kind of 
a victim of a virtual uh, lynching. And it, when, once you are such a victim, it becomes really hard to believe in humankind and to love humans. But then as Hannah Arendt said once, forgiving is a freeing experience. I had to forgive the human in my you know, own contemplation. And then I have to write up, I had to write a book about it. And then while writing the book, I realized that, which is the most uh, you know, important problem of today's progressive struggle. Uh, we hate the other, that's obvious. Uh, societies are crumbling, they're dissolving. We hate the other polar. There's this you know, immense polarization, but we do not love our likes either. We do not love them. And that's why we lost the joy of the progressive struggle. And joy is another political concept that I, I have been thinking about, I've been writing about. So these two concepts, love and joy, joy of dignity and love of human, we have to practice using these words in a political context and then try to understand uh, the effect, try to see the effect. And then on, we can realize how uh, damaged our own humanity is. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eje, for this uh, conclusion. Uh, but you have to nominate the next speaker. We make we are making this round, so you just tell us who is next. Ah, tough, tough choice. <laughs> tough, tough choice. It looked like a very tough choice. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> okay, Eva, please. I understand the question. Um, First of all, I think, you know, in this crisis, we have had to learn an opposite moral repertoire than the one we're used to, because, because love is about proximity and getting close, and we've had to learn that to love is to, is to be afar and to get distance. So I was extremely perplexed by this inversion of our moral repertoire, our way of thinking of, uh, you know, the role of the body and the, the, the proximity and, and distance. So if this has to do with the period, I, 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 I'm very perplexed since it's an inversion of everything we know. I have to rejoin also, I mean, what Michael was saying before, what I miss tremendously is actually weak ties what uh, sociologist Mark Granovetter has called weak ties. These are people that are not terribly close to you, but that you may encounter and that give you, uh, you know, open up worlds that are not yours. So the, the weak ties for me are very, uh, are the ones that, I mean, I'm very close right now to my children. I'm with them all the time. And so, and the weak ties is what I really miss uh, uh, the most. But now if I had to take your question more generally, uh, uh, for me, the couple and sexuality, I mean, this cult of love as being centered around sexuality and the couple and intimacy has been a way to completely diminish and narrow the spectrum of love. And so for me, it would be a, 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 a revolutionary politics of love would consist in opening it up, opening up uh, not necessarily in the form of polyamory, this is not what I have in mind, but just not making it this hyper-specialized bond that it has become. And in that sense, I don't know if I'm there very far from Christian love. I mean, we would have to rework it um, into more uh, secular frameworks. But that, for me, is uh, um, very uh, appealing. And finally, I would say we cannot rethink love without um, the feminist perspective on it, since um, feminism has discovered that in love and through love, so much inequities and so much of the political structure is actually embedded in it. So uh, um, we can't really rethink love without, um, uh, you know, destroying those political structures that were embedded in it. 
um, and we are just starting the process. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Eva. I must also admit uh, that I miss the contingency and the surprises, uh, uh, which are related to being outside of home, uh, uh, which is not a contradiction to what Slavoj said, of course, the true loneliness. Uh, but Eva, you can choose whether Slavo will be the next or oh. Alenka. It's a big choice. Uh, um, you know, what <laughs> Slavo. Just say a name. <laughs> Okay, so it's me. I uh, wait a minute. I have to. Yeah, you are unmuted, Slavoj. So if you, the floor is yours. I, uh, what did I do here? Something wrong. I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, you. Yeah, but I did something terribly wrong. I don't know what uh, here. No, no, I, no. We uh, were over on the screen. We could hear you. Okay, Just okay, okay, okay. Very briefly, very briefly, when we talk about reinventing love, uh, poli pol political liberation and so on, you know, love is, and I agree with the last point that was made, what made, love is in politics a very ambiguous notion. None other than Adorno wrote years ago that beware of the regimes which legitimize themselves on behalf of the subjects love for the leader you know so love it's not so simple or let's go concretely to the united states today there are two persons with big politicians who trigger love let's be brutal it's trump and bernie sanders and for me the moment of love where I saw hope was, do you remember at the inauguration, a fake spectacle, if there ever was one, Bernie sitting alone there on a chair, and I wrote in a text that it was, you know, Hegel's well-known remark when he saw Hegel, sorry, uh, when he saw Napoleon riding through Vienna after the battle, it's as if I saw the world spirit, Weltgeist, uh, riding on a horse there. I think at this disgusting spectacle of Biden inauguration, Weltgeist, the world spirit, was there embodied in the lonely figure of Biden. But yes, I agree with you. Love has to be reinvented. You know why? Because I think politics without this collective dimension of agape, political love, is an affair of specialists, technocrats, manipulations, and so on and so on. This transcendent dim dimension of full subjective engagement can only be uh, provided by love. And just a final remark about uh, I think, was it you, Michael, who mentioned the joy, no, sorry, it was one of the ladies, of bringing back joy to progressive politics. You mentioned, you hit the nail correctly. Joy is, for me, what is missing in a certain type of political correctness. All the pleasure you get there is the very decadent pleasure of, oh my God, I discovered a little bit of racism here, a little bit of feminism there, and so on, and so on. Yes, absolutely agree. We should bring joy back to politics. That's why, in contrast to typical liberal American feminist Nancy Fraser described nicely how they kidnapped to a strong degree to liberalism, to neoliberalism, American feminism. That's why, for example, I admire Mexican feminists. It's a totally different approach. They deal with the same problems, but in a joyful way, not in this rigid, morally way. So yes, joy, love are needed in politics, absolutely. Without this, we can leave everything to algorithm and experts. Thanks, Slavoj. I think I couldn't agree more. Uh, and thanks to everyone for this joyful session. I mean, I must admit, honestly, usually these screens and all these conversations and the never-ending zoomification of, la of life uh, and love and friendship uh, is turning me a bit depressive. Uh, but it was really joyful and I think it's, it's an important lesson uh, for progressives across the world, you know, 
I would even go so far to say, if you look at the Capitol Hill, uh, uh, the storming of the Capitol Hill, which was a sort of a farce, it was definitely joyful for those who participated. So I think we have to take back the joy from the populist side. Right. Yes, it's your floor <laughs> anyhow, Alenka, so sorry. <laughs> I thought you, you just wanted to joyfully conclude. <laughs> Please, no, 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 no. I know it's your turn, but now you have the responsibility to joyfully conclude. <laughs> to really conclude. joyfully conclude. Uh, I think I was just thinking about uh, how one could return to this divide, Eros Agape, and how perhaps another way of thinking about it without positing this kind of uh, uh, alternative, either love or the social, would be uh, to actually think of uh, it, uh, or, or of this difference, more as the difference, in the difference of timing. What I mean is that you have, even in love, you have two very different things. You have what is called amour passion, this kind of passionate disengaging from everything else, this kind of being completely enwrapped only with your erotic other, which is usually associated with the moment of falling in love or with some kind of ecstatic state, very little dynamics, uh, just ecstasies of love. But you also have love in its temporality. What is the temporality of love? The love that takes place and time. It is the kind of precisely work of love, which I think is in its very structure related uh, in many ways uh, uh, to the social and in a, a absolutely crucial ways. And I think it is very important what uh, Eva said at some point, namely that what this pandemic revealed is that there is no true intimacy that could actually have its space and articulate itself if there is no social at the same time. Without this, uh, outside of the social, there is no way in which you could even experience something or uh, work on something as love. So I think there is this dimension of love as uh, duration, as a certain work, but precisely not work in the sense of something tiresome, you know, oh, I need <laughs> to work on love, but precisely as this, uh, joyfully, but nevertheless, also laborious experience of doing something, creating something, and that this is uh, related to, to, to a social dimension of love and to a certain dimension of joy that some kind of uh, endeavors of this uh, kind should possess and have. So, yeah, I would perhaps conclude like this. Beautiful conclusion, Alenka. Thanks a lot, uh, and thanks uh, again to everyone uh, uh, for your inspiring thoughts, for the joy we had tonight. Uh, thanks to everyone who watched us. Uh, if you liked this uh, session of The Internationalist, please consider uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please consider donating uh, to The Progressive International, which uh, uh, depends on individual donations of people like me and you. Uh, so thanks a lot to everyone. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, and let's reconquer the emancipatory role of love in progressive politics.